on Zoom thing. Uh, so, so I'd like to um, introduce our second um, webinar of our of our virtual webinar series, the uh, Professional Women's Network of Nice Côte d'Azur. Decided that once we all got confined, which was now a month ago, a little over a month ago, that how we could best support our members was by providing um, so a series of free virtual webinars. Um, so today, I'm really you know, very happy to. This is the second one in a series. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, Victor Purton as our as our speaker and as our as our host in um, our compare. Um, and I'd also like to welcome our corporate partners. We have some people from Amadeus, Schneider, Edek, uh, who are our three corporate partners down here who've been very supportive in what we're trying to do. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we're happy for you to join. Um, for your support and your participation and also to thank all of the, the attendees who came on to our cafe and hopefully this will be the first of um, many different virtual events that we can provide to, to our membership um, in this period where we can't get together face to face. Uh, I'd also like to um, talk a little bit about Victor. He'll, he'll talk about himself as well, but <laughs> let me give an introduction to him. So, so Victor is um, an author. He's, he's written two books. He's a speaker, a moderator, uh, a lawyer. Um, and he's, the books that he's written um, come from research that he started from the Australian Leadership Project, which is where I first crossed paths with him when he was interviewing people uh, around the world, Australians who in different positions to ask what was unique, what made them optimistic about Australian leadership. Um, and from that, he uh, went on to create the Centre for Optimism in Australia He's uh, had a very, very interesting and varied international career. He was the uh, Australia Commissioner to the Americas, so in San Francisco, the Bay Area. Um, he was a politician for 18 years, uh, and he was senior advisor to, to Australia um, for the G when Australia had the G20 um, presidency and leadership summit. And he's the board member on a very wide range of different boards, um, including the Yarra Valley Water Board, um, the Life Grant Health Network, um, and the Global Integrity Summit, as well as the Australian Centre for Financial Studies. So Victor has his fingers in many, many pies. That was a very brief introduction to what he does. So one of the things he's doing to help people around the world um, during this challenging time is he's running optimism cafes with different people and uh, helping people find their optimism. So Victor, um, thank you very much for joining us this morning and over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and, and lovely to join you. I feel that I'm virtually in France, so I feel very, very good. Um, so just um, a little bit of that history. So I um, had traveled the world and from my Australian perspective, um, everywhere I'd gone, um, there was this romantic notion of Australia. And in the United States, it made my work very easy. You know, we had a project to visit 100 major corporations over um, two years. It only took us nine months. You know, when we said we're from Australia and we want to tell you the Australian story, it was very positive and very romantic. Um, the chairman of Caterpillar said, you Australians remind me the Americans of 100 years ago, nothing is impossible. And that's the, the global stereotype of Australians. And then at the G20, you know, with um, the super elite um, presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers, central bank governors, um, it was reinforced. And then in 2015, I settled down back in Australia and was astonished by the level of negativity. And Rather than complain about those complaining, um, I created a project where, as Amanda said, we interviewed two and a half thousand people around the world and looked at the qualities of Australian leadership. And at the end, it was pretty good. You know, no people on earth have lived better than the Australians of today. And yet they seemed to be astonishingly unhappy. And my eureka moment came at the Global Integrity Summit in 2017, where after three days of misery, you can imagine that the Global Integrity Summit is about a, a lot of miserable topics, corruption, prisoners of conscience. Um, my final presentation on the case for optimism changed the mindset of the room. And you would know of Helen Clark, the former New Zealand Prime Minister, and then 
head of the United Nations Development Program said, Victor, um, you must turn that into a book. And uh, it turned into a book and it turned into speaking engagements. And in August of last year, it turned into the Centre for Optimism. And we now have a thousand members from the heads of psychology of universities in the United States, in Europe, uh, in England, uh, business leaders and the like, because the, the time has come where we have to shake off this pessimism that affects the Western world. I mean, France you know, has been renowned as pessimistic for decades, um, but Australia and New Zealand and many other parts of the Western world have joined you. And it's in stark contrast, for instance, to Arabia, where I've just been asked to do my next project. So let me just take you through just a few little slides if, oh no, I can't take you. Can someone enable my slides? Uh, yes. Vanessa, can you enable the slides, please? Just enable um, I've, the I've just slides. shared the screen with you, so you should be able to access those now. Thank you. Um, so uh, you can share your screen now. So it's the bottom. Perfect. That's it, yeah. Uh, look, so I'd say what the world needs now, remember the um, old song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Um, I would say what the world needs now is realistic and infectiously optimistic leaders. Um, and realistic and infectiously optimistic leaders like the ladies in this room. Now, I only want you to remember three things of what I've said today. Um, the leader is the person I see in my mirror. And you may even want to put a yellow sticky note or write it, those of you who use red lipstick, on your mirror. The leader is the person I see in my mirror. The second thing is a question I'd like you, your homework today is to go and ask your partner, a child, a mother, a colleague, what makes you optimistic? And then the third thing, which I've only added to my presentations in the last week, is surround yourself with optimists. You all know that if you're at a board meeting or any meeting and there's one <coughs> miserable person with the word but and, and trying to interrupt, uh, there's nothing more frustrating. And I've added that because when I asked the American leadership leader, Professor Bill George, who wrote True North, he said this to me, he said, I'm optimistic because I believe in the inherent goodness of people and I am surrounded with positive, optimistic people. What a blessing. And indeed, um, Megan, um, the Duchess of Sussex, I think she's still the Duchess, isn't she, Amanda? I suppose so, Victor. Not, <laughs> not my area of expertise. <laughs> but, but, but Duchess Megan, you know, said, um, what you need is realistic, sensible, optimistic people around you to keep you uplifted. So what is optimism? So it's not Pollyanna. Optimism is an expectation that good things will happen and that things will work out in the end. So it's not a, a, a Pollyanna belief that there's a, a silver lining in every cloud. You know, bad things happen in this pandemic. It's right that there are people living in fear. There are people in anxiety. There are people mourning friends and relatives who've died. Um, and optimism doesn't deny that, you know, bad things happen, but it's a belief that things will work out in the end. Now, why should you ask that question that I ask? What makes you optimistic? Um, some of you would be aware of the work of Professor Martin Seligman, the, the guru of positive psychology. Um, he ticked off my question, but this lady put it very well, Mickey Magumi, the author of Quietly Powerful. When I asked her the question, she said, even being asked the question, what makes you optimistic, caused me to look for the bright side, which is very uplifting. And when you couple optimism with the courage to confront reality, it is a powerful force for positive change. And I've asked women digging ditches in India in their saris. Um, I've asked presidents, I've asked prime ministers, I asked the prime minister of Papua New Guinea recently, and in every case, you know, they sort of stop and they say, wow, no one has ever asked me that question before. And you always, almost always get an evocative question, uh, answer, I'm sorry. Now, one of the projects I'm working on is, of course, coronavirus through the eyes of an optimist. And Stephen Moffitt, who's there, is a, quite a famous psychiatrist from the US. 
essential for mental well-being in a crisis that needs action. Um, now, as never in our lifetimes, we need to remain optimistic. And if you go to the website, centerforoptimism.com, whether you spell it in the Australian English way or the American way, um, you'll find deep resources. And um, I'd, I'd offer you all free membership. There's um, certainly, um, you'd be welcome to join and, and I'd be delighted to give that to you as a gift. Now, um, all good leadership is optimistic. Um, Dominic Barton, the head of McKinsey, said this to me. And he said, it's not the leader who stands up and makes the grand speech. It's the leader who can unpick it in his team, who can help his team find their optimism. And you know, since then, I've spoken to lots of leadership experts, and this seems to be one of the keys. Optimism is the underpinning of resilience. You know, in, in there's such a push around the world um, to support resilience in children. Um, but close to you in Paris, of course, there's the OECD and the research they've done on children's education, for instance. They say the central um, trait for success in community and life um, is optimism. And you can't be resilient if you don't believe the future will be better. Optimistic leaders are the realists. I won't dwell on this at long. I mean, if you read what Bill Gates publishes and others, you know, talking about how the world has improved. And one of the examples Bill Gates gives, for instance, um, is we have halved the malaria death rate this century. So 1,000 children will live today who would have died, but you never read that in the newspapers. It's um, an astonishing blind side. Um, optimism is the underpinning of strategy. We've just completed a research study, um, 36 countries, uh, 400 professionals working in strategy. 90% um, believe that strategy should be an optimistic process. 60% of those people think they've worked in an optimistic strategy creation process, but only 20% measure optimism. So as you all know, what you don't measure, you, you don't necessarily know um, so there's a, a clear gap there. Optimism is the underpinning of innovation. It doesn't matter what company you work in, what country you live in. Um, we're all being pushed to be innovative. And the science says you can't be innovative if you're a pessimist. Um, pessimists are ground down by what went wrong. Um, who's at fault? Um, and it just slows down the process. Whereas the optimist says, if, if I may use so bold a word, shit happens. You know, we will make a mistake. You know, we will have a product that goes wrong. We will try something that doesn't work. And it's that try and try again um, that is the characteristic of the optimist. And there's a very good, very large database out of Canada um, on which I found that. But if you, again, go to the website, um, you'll find literally hundreds of, of underpinnings for that. Optimism is the underpinning of entrepreneurship. I don't, for ladies like you who are entrepreneurial, I don't think I need, to, I think I'm teaching you to, to suck eggs, um, whether it's Branson or a friend of mine, Chris Gale, who drills for lithium in Argentina. He says you can't drill for lithium in Argentina unless you're an optimist. And I think that's so true of any entrepreneurial exercise. And optimism is good for your health. Um, the science on this is very recent. You won't have seen this in your university studies or the like, but Harvard, the Boston University, and the American military in September, um, a huge study over many decades, individuals with greater optimism are more likely to live longer and to live healthily beyond the age of 85. Um, and they were looking for genetics, they were looking for geography, uh, they were looking for diet, but in fact, the trait that stood out the most was optimism. Healthier heart, um, the American College of Cardiology, um, study of studies, 200,000 people. Optimism is the trait most linked to a lower risk of heart attack, angina, and the greatest predictor of recovery. And the Mount Sinai Medical System published a report on that late last year, again, a huge study surprised the researchers um, that it was optimism that was the key. Better sleep. Um, optimism, typically, you reach your maximum in your late 50s to 60s. 
People often talk about optimism of the young, but it's in fact the positivity of the young. It, it's people of my age and a bit older um, who've gone through the mill, tried many things, who understand that the first broken romance is the one of many. Um, the first failure is the one of many. Um, and optimists tend to be able to put those things in their head and go to sleep and sleep well. And of course, sleep is a foundation um, of so many health aspects. And the last one, ladies, um, is an optimistic spouse is better for your health. Um, the University of Michigan has um, done a terrific study which shows that if you have an optimistic husband, wife or partner, um, those same impacts um, help you. Now, if you're now single um, for the first time or divorced, um, on your first date um, with your next date, I'd suggest you ask them what makes them optimistic. Uh, but the good thing is, if you are already in a partnership, um, you can do some things to make your partner um, more optimistic. And I'll run through these very quickly because I've actually got a, a toolkit of 20 or 30 um, tricks. We call them the habits of an optimistic leader. Number one is smile, just smiling more. It's the, the simplest thing. Everyone in this call has been smiling. Um, but... Um, Smiling at strangers, you know, when you walk down the street, you know, that look into someone else's eye and, and good morning, hello, um, it, it lifts you, it lifts them. I mean, these days, so many people are wearing buds in their ears and watching their phone, but, but smiling like an optimist is, is just a great reminder. Turn down the news. The news in right around the world has become shockingly bad. So in the mid 70s, the news was roughly 50-50 good, bad. Today, it's running 95% bad. So I suggest you listen to the news on your way to work in the morning, certainly not at the beginning, maybe once later in the day, but put yourself on a diet in news. People are hungry for stories about optimism and hope. And in business, um, that's the thing you offer people. And if you can share more stories of hope and optimism with other people, uh, and Disney has certainly discovered that um, Coca-Cola um, is one of the companies that has pushed that way. Even in the Paris fashion shows this year, there were counter-cultural designers using yellow and orange and um, the colours of optimism. Um, people are hungry for it. Uh, meditation. Meditation is very powerful. I actually did a um, webinar yesterday with some people from Colorado and they actually got me to do a meditation in the middle of it. And um, I'm a strong rap for meditation. I've recorded a few myself. Um, people are donating us wonderful meditations. Um, and we use them. Sometimes I just use my watch and a one minute meditation. My guided meditations are five minutes. But you know the theory um, from the Dalai Lama and others um, that the... Um, that... that um, using meditation increases the thickness of the frontal portion of the brain from where happiness and, and joy emanates from. And um, it's a very powerful mechanism. And then, um, uh, sorry, um, yoga. Um, I recommend yoga. Um, I'm quoting my mother there. Uh, my mother taught yoga to the age of 91. Um, and um, she's only stopped teaching um, for some reasons associated with old age, but um, for 91 years, as she said, daily practice of yoga and meditation are ways of achieving optimistic mindset and presence. Of course, in the lockdown, yoga is a great way of staying fit. Um, language. Um, this is an interesting one. I should have done this in French, but I'm not confident enough. But in France and in Australia, when you ask someone, how are you? you typically get an answer that is not too bad or not bad. And so it's a wasted question and a wasted answer. And so I'd like you to try a little experiment uh, one day for one week. Um, rather than saying to someone, how are you? Ask them what's the best thing happening for you. And they will look at you as if you're some sort of weirdo. They'll say, <laughs> I've never been asked this question before. Um, but just try that. Um, instead of how are you, what's the best thing happening for you? And then at the other end, if someone says, how are you? 
be very theatrical. You know, girls are better at being theatrical than boys, I think. Um, but just pause and say, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, I was on a really interesting webinar today, or I, you know, went to the Business Women's Network, or I did something interesting. But, but throw something that invites the next question, uh, the second question. Um, another thing that, that is highly recommended, and, and those of you who've studied um, positive psychology will be aware of it, um, and that is gratitude. You know, to say thank you um, either to yourself, keeping a journal. Um, I have two teenage children. And so at the end of dinner, they know they can't leave the table until we've gone around the table saying, what are the three best things in the day? Um, but gratitude is a very powerful underpinning for optimism. And I say more thanks than sorry. You know, when you're in a supermarket and you bump into someone and um, they say sorry, um, really, I'd, I'd like to hear more of thank you. So at the end of the day, have a, have a real think about sending an SMS or sending an email or even sending a handwritten letter um, or making a phone call to say thank you to, to someone for what they did today, what they did this week, or in fact, what they did 20 years ago. Now, I just whipped through these ones because uh, there's my favorite slide of the leader is the person you see in your mirror. Just imagine what he was thinking 10 years ago when he was still a senator. Um, what makes you optimistic? Um, zillions of answers I've got. I've now got thousands of answers, but this is my absolute favorite. Um, this is a neuroscientist, um, uh, Korean origin, and she took 14 months to give me the answer. And optimism is the evidence for the dreams yet to be realized. And uh, I'll stop the presentation there because I think this is about a conversation. This is a cafe. And um, so rather than me just talking, 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 um, I think it's, it's time for conversation. But there's lots and lots of material. Um, if you, as I said, if you go to the Center for Optimism website, we've got webinars, we've got um, quotations on coronavirus, we've got the tools of the optimist. Um, and I'd love you all to, to be part of, of our fraternity and um, to become part of, of, of the, the optimists who are going to save the world. So I think that's enough from me, Amanda, if that's okay. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. And I should also mention, because I forgot in my introduction, but you, you're very, very present across different social media channels. And one thing that I particularly like is there's always a new quote every morning on, on LinkedIn, sometimes more than once a day. And, you know, if you're having, you're having a not so great day, which, you know, it's a difficult time right now. You go onto LinkedIn or you go onto Facebook and you're popping up with a quote from someone interesting around the world who's talking about what makes them optimistic. It, it's just a little lift. So I, I encourage people to follow um, also on the social media channels. But uh, and I'd invite yeah. them, I'd invite each of the ladies here to share their answer because each of them is interesting. So the answer, and people love it. You know, your friends love it, your family love it, your business associates love it to, to see what you're saying in respect, so particularly through the coronavirus. I think there's nothing more important than giving people that hope um, that something positive is happening. Yes, absolutely. So I think the bots may be best is we open up all the my all the mutes. Um, so if if people would like to ask a question, take yourself off mute because I see that you're all on mute right now, um, and ask away. And I have a few as well to get the ball rolling. But let's open it up to the floor first. We're a you know cafe, <laughs> not a two way conversation. So I do I have a, anybody? I have a Lala? Yes, I have a question. You said we in in strategies or in companies only twenty percent are measuring optimism. But what kind of uh, tool you use to measure optimism? So, so which way to measure it? Yeah. So so the most powerful mechanism is the one to one. Um, so I in fact even do it in prisons um, with with quite serious prisoners, murderers, um, drug traffickers. And we did three sessions and each one there were 20 prisoners and we went around the room and it was interesting to see the prisoners being moved um, by the other prisoners. And there was one guy who'd recovered from cancer. There was a, just extraordinary stories. Even the most notorious gangland killer in Australia 
shared his answer and he'd done his homework. It was so powerful in changing the language of the prisoners that the prison guards asked me to do sessions for them. And we then did a session for the heads of the prisons. So, so the most powerful mechanism is the most arduous, and that is going around the circle and asking what makes you optimistic. And I had a businessman from Singapore who recently got me to do that for him. Um, his sales team, he thought, he would give them a speech on Monday morning and by Monday afternoon, the effect of it had died. And I said to him, why don't you ask them what makes them optimistic? So once a month now, he goes around the time. So that's the most powerful methodology. Then I've been doing um, a series of keynote speeches for the International Association of Contracted Commercial Management in Madrid, Sydney, Phoenix. And at the same time, they recruited a couple of academics out of UC Irvine. And so there's some good psychometric testing, um, but that's obviously more intrusive. But if you're doing, for instance, well-being surveys of the workers um, and the like, it's easy to slip in some questions on the, the, that are characteristic of optimism. But then the most critical thing, and particularly in strategy, is understanding whether the stakeholders um, are optimistic about it. And I think that, you know, there are oblique methods, but the best method is direct interview. You know, okay. why do you think um, this commercial arrangement will leave us better? And the interesting thing about the contract people was that that's what they want. They think that artificial intelligence, machine learning, is going to put lots of lawyers and contract negotiators out of business. And, and so it's really picking up the phone or once we can go back into real cafes, yeah. having those conversations. So it is arduous. So, so the most powerful methodology is the one-to-one -one question. The second one is, is and my friends from UC Irvine can help with this. Maybe we could do this in three months or four months, Amanda, because I've got to do this follow-up research from our survey. We can come back and, and talk about this directly as a topic, Lala. Oh, that would be great. Because mm. it's very uh, interesting to uh, put into action what, what we learn. Yeah, yeah. And we'll start off just with that question. And just if, with your partner or your children tonight, oh, I'm, I'm ask thinking them of... what makes them optimistic. Okay, I will uh, try around me to find people, yes. Yeah. Okay, in, general, in general, I'm the one optimistic for everyone. Yeah, yeah, but you've got to draw them. You've got to help them find their optimism. Mm. So, okay. A funny little story. I was in India and there was this big American, well, there was a big man sitting near me at the taxi stand. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm here to do railway engineering. And I said, oh, good. That sounds fascinating. And, and he was miserable. <laughs> and I said, but what makes you optimistic? And he said, bloody nothing. <laughs> and um, I, we talked for a few minutes. And the next morning, I heard this loud American voice in the dining room saying, Vance, Vance. Now, he didn't remember my name, but he remembered how I made him feel. And he said, you completely changed my mindset. My day was astonishingly good because you set me off on an optimistic path. So it's really, but it's, it's, you and I can be passionate optimists and, and be fervent, but we need to help those people around us find what makes them optimistic. Okay. And, and oftentimes we did a global survey, which included a lot of French people. The, the most important thing that makes people optimistic is life experience. Yeah, that's true. Now then it's, yeah. then it's family, friends, faith, God, meditation, but the most powerful force for optimism is life experience. So uh, who else has got a question? Otherwise I have a few, but um, Janine. Janine, Janine. Hi, Victor, Janine Sonsi, a Melbourne girl now living in Vance, I'm just 20 minutes from Nice, and um, also a friend of Helen Mack, so, who I know you know. <laughs> So you can't avoid her. <laughs> um, so you sort of covered it because my question was, you know, when you meet these, or when we meet these really negative 
I guess the negative Nancy's, yeah. apart from asking them that question, what makes you positive? What other ways are the best to help them, you know, let go of their negativity and, you know, and move from pessimism to optimism? Yeah, it, it's very hard. I mean, it, it, it's the most important thing is that you keep yourself optimistic and, and surround yeah. yourself with optimists when you do that list for who you're going to have coffee with or who you're going to have dinner with. Um, make sure, as Bill George says, you know, surround yourself with optimists. Um, the trick with the, the negative is to sometimes, well, obviously, you, you, if you ask them the question, what makes you optimistic? You don't say, are you an optimist? Because yeah. they'll look at you and say, no, what, what sort of idiot's an optimist? God, I always thought you were dumb. And um, so the trick is to say, what makes you optimistic? You know, is, it, is there something that lifts you? Um, you know, family, friends, or get them to share a story. I think that, you know, when you catch up with them, it's that, what is the best thing happening for you? Um, mm. What's the best thing that's happened? And, and you're, you will be the first person in their life to ever ask them that question. And they will stare at you. And then in, in work, what we've done, because um, obviously sometimes people are working with people who are superior to them or equal to them around the board table. Um, and the negative Nancy, as you say, or, or the person waiting to say, but. Yes. Um, yeah, that's what I hate. You know, I love someone who says, and, but saying, yeah. but is what a lot of people are aching to do. It's try giving them a little job at the conference table to maybe report on a positive story. Now, a friend of mine actually did a huge job. Sean Callahan, who's on our advisory board, um, collects business stories. But it, it's asking them to share a story that, that, that has some hope and optimism. And when I, I can I, a funny thing is, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not, but um, I had a friend ring me from Brazil. And he said, I've been talking to Martin Seligman and he'd love to see you. And of course, Martin's in Philadelphia and I'm in Melbourne. And I sent a message to his secretary and there was no answer. And a week later, um, who should be walking up the corridor towards me in Melbourne but Martin Seligman? And I said, wow, you know, Pedro said we should catch up. Um, look, I, I don't want to bother you and your wife. You're on here on holidays, but, you know, can I come and see you in Philadelphia? He said, no, you'll never get past my secretary. Have a coffee now. And he said to me, look, I love your question, what makes you optimistic? It nails 40 years of research. But for mm -hmm. some people who don't like the word optimism, like the Pope, you say, what gives you hope? So the Pope, for some reason, because of his Argentinian roots and anti-Americanism, hates the word optimism. So for some people, use the word hope. Um, and that helps. But happy to talk to you at length online because it's actually the most difficult thing. And, and sometimes you just, if, if you've got the power to fire them, just fire them. You know, let them get a job in somewhere, some, some other people who appreciate pessimists. Well, I've got a group here in, at the moment, it's on Facebook called For Expat Women in France. Yeah. And it's all about support and positivity and optimism. So... Yeah, so I, I really push that. But you know, there's not many, not many women get into the group who are the negative thinkers. I think they recognise it's just not the place for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, but that's healthy for you. You know, it, it, it's really... Um, one of the billionaires in, in Melbourne just said that my strategy was to surround myself with optimists. Mm -hmm. And um, Twiggy Forrest, you know, the Australian mining billionaire, um, he says, I only have optimists around the board table. He said, I pay for the pessimists by the hour. They come from law firms and accounting firms. <laughs> I like that, yes. <laughs> That's what we pay them for. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have uh, done any cross-cultural studies on this, because as following up on this and as you ask the question, just even saying, how are you? I can well remember that as an American, my automatic response was great. And then when I moved to Italy, 
people would visibly move back and they go, whoa, whoa, <laughs> and Petropo, it's a little bit too much. In France, it would be pas mal. Um, something Amanda and I have also spoken about, I think it has a lot to do with our, our unique histories, et cetera, but it's how much control do we feel in our life? So especially with the situation right now in, um, for some people who take it, very negatively, like in um, Italy, and I, I see Marina is on here as well, she might have a comment on this. Um, optimism would be a pretty big word right now, but I think that your answer in terms of changing that to hopeful would empower people enough to feel that they could do that. So just wondering, one, if you have done cross-cultural studies on this and notices differences in China or Japan or whatever to that question, and we're also, it's hard to give a, a personal opinion. They tend to give the group. But how does this play out across cultures? And, and uh, have you done any recently in the uh, virus, specifically in yeah. that culture? So, so pre-pandemic, um, I'd done a lot of work in South Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and the Indians, um, when you interview them, it's off, always, almost always about family or God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a strong spiritual foundation to their optimism. Uh, the North Africans, um, the Arabic people tend to be very optimistic, particularly their younger people. Um, Asia generally, um, the Chinese um, post Mao tend to be much more optimistic um, than Western populations. Um, funnily enough, cross-culturally in the United States, which ethnic group do you think is the most optimistic, Cynthia? Um, which would you include here in your ethnicity? How are you defining the ethnicity? Uh, skin color, um, ethnic origin. I don't have the correct answer of that. The quickest one you think about is who feels economically uh, uh, safe, and that would probably be your white upper middle class. I think that for uh, people of, of color that have religion, that would put them up very high for optimism, surprisingly so, but they have a very good strong sense of, of group. So that would be um, my thought on that. Um, Asians have seen that they could, in fact, change their destiny. It's the land of where you can supposedly do that. So I'm interested in the answer. I'm not sure. Black people. That's what I would so have thought. The black population the in America, yeah. it's founded in their spirituality, their singing, um, their family links. Uh, Latinos are second. Mm -hmm. um, and the white population far behind. Mm -hmm. um, Australia is very much a land of immigration. Um, our studies on refugees, so for instance, refugee youth in Australia, 90% of them feel they belong and are optimistic for their careers, compared to 65% for native born Australians. So refugees tend to have a very high level of optimism. Migrants in general have a very high level of optimism. So if globally, I mean, obviously the, the word changes, but um, it's at its lowest in countries like France, Russia, um, Australia and New Zealand have moved down a long way over the last 20 years, um, mainly because of the impact of a very negative media. So the news- You know offhand of somewhere that uh, has those statistics? Is there, a, do you, offhand, do you have somewhere that has those statistics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I've got it on my blog. Um, I've got to update it, but, um, but the pandemic, and we'll, yeah, in fact, we've done our own statistics. So we've done our own, our, la our last yeah. study asking um, what makes you optimistic. We had participants, I think, from 40 countries. Yeah, um, very interesting. But, yeah. but if, 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 so if we had to throw stereotypes at it, though, your most optimistic populations today are found in North Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, Latin America, after that it would be Latin America. Um, then it would be probably the United States. And then it would be the countries of Europe, and I would include Australia and New Zealand with those countries of Europe. And well, it, Islamic look, culture should be high as well, relatively high as well, because yeah, there yeah, is it, that feeling of, of inshallah and God will take care of us and whatever he wills is good. So you would expect them, it's, 
and, and again, the terminology there is very interesting, whether it would be acceptance or, you know, happiness, which words were used. Interesting to see your research. Yeah, and Sikhism, for instance, the theology of Sikhism mm -hmm. uh, requires you to be optimistic. Yes. Um, and I, um, I'm Catholic by religion, but I meditate with the Brahma Kumaris which is a women-led Hindu movement in India, very close to um, the Prime Minister, and their 103-year-old leader, um, a lady who was still working hard until the age of 102 has just died. Um, but she was the utter optimist. And um, in their dining room, they have a, um, a picture which says, you know, eat of the food of positivity. Um, so, yeah, so, so you get a lot of those, lots of different cultural things. I'm happy to share lots of it with you, Cynthia, because, um, yeah, there's good material. Um, yeah, good material. There's, there's some very good research around it. In fact, I've, I've just, as I said, I was on a call to Paris um, about an hour and a half ago, um, and I've been asked to do a project um, out of um, the Emirates. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a very interesting, I think it's a very interesting dimension to it. For instance, you mentioned India, and if you come into the airport in Mumbai, there's a very large fresco, and it says, you know, the, and it shows a big cart with all the food, and it said, you know, uh, work hard for the fruits of your labor, and underneath it, it says, but don't expect to eat from the cart. And, you know, as an American, it's like, whoa, they've got it all wrong. But by the same token, I think that's that difference between that, you know, white upper class, I've worked hard, I deserve all of these, to the Indian, which is, you know, don't expect to eat from it. So your tolerance, your, you know, it, it, you, you have your links to other kinds of things in your culture. It would make a big difference, but it, it would be, um, I, I look forward to seeing the research and thank you some sharing some thoughts with you about what, what drives it. It really died. And for me, the, the loveliest thing was asking the poorest people in India, you know, a woman digging a ditch, you know, out on a rural highway. And, and you ask her the question and she grins at you. And, and you know, they're, I, radiant. Don't they're absolutely anything. radiant digging ditches. Yeah. And, and it would be, you know, it, it's well, I have got a job, you know, so I'm not just, you know, living off one acre of, of, of dusty land. Um, and B, it, it's this God and family, which is so powerful for them. Um, just to, as a, one possibility to add to the pot there, although I do think it's family and ritual and all that sort of thing, when I've asked that question in India, or one similar to it, the answer is very often, uh, for instance, somebody getting married and, you know, are you excited about it? I've never met them. Are you worried about it? They said, no, this is just one life. I've got many lives. So if it doesn't work out in this life, it'll work out in the next life. And so our belief systems, I think our history with Italy, you see it's very much tied to uh, history of in, in, invasions and losing everything as it is in Greeks. So that causal factor, whereas the Americans, you didn't survive if you weren't optimistic. You didn't get on yeah. the boat to come over. So, you know. No, you, you put it beautifully. So happy to, happy to work with you on that, Cynthia. So I do, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. No, I was going to say, who are any more questions? Okay. Please, like, go ahead. Hi, everybody. That's Teresa. I don't have my video on because I'm not uh, feeling, uh, I'm in my jogging clothes. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, my question is, I, I how do you... I've my orange jacket for you, Teresa. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I wanted, I'm curious as to how you um, differentiate between faith, hope, and optimism. Really good question. So, so op optimism is, as I defined earlier, um, this belief that things will work out in the end. Um, faith is, is obviously associated with a belief system in some other power. So faith is generally um, associated with religion. Um, although, interesting enough, when we ask, with the two global surveys we've done now, we often get faith in humanity. So, so, so you get two levels of faith. One is, is the faith in God. We, we talked about the Sikhs and the Hindus and, and others for, for whom, and Jewish. In fact, if you have a look at my website, we've got a lot of Jewish thought that says you can't be a Jew unless you are an optimist. 
um, because of, of all the things that the Jews have gone through. And then at the other end, um, our other bit of research says faith in mankind or faith in my fellow human being. Um, and then hope is the one that, that really the Pope pushes. And that is this um, belief system that says something will intervene. So both faith and hope are more something else intervening, whereas optimism is more a belief that you keep going, things will work out. And so, so my, my argument with the um, Anglican and Catholic churches is that both of their leaders um, are sort of anti-optimism and pro-faith and hope, um, whereas the Eastern religions are more pro-optimism. And then in the US, of course, it plays out those big Protestant churches, you know, the, the reborn um, are often amongst the most optimistic people as well. So um, they're hard distinctions. So um, Martin Seligman, you know, who's the inventor of positive psychology, his um, last book was called Hope. Um, and, and it's really interesting to read the science. In fact, even he, yeah, so I'm rambling a little bit now. But I would say that, that the underpinning of hope and faith is a belief in the intervention of someone else. So the Pope would say, that's a belief that Jesus is going to come back. Um, or if you're Jewish, it's a belief that the Messiah will come. Um, optimism, as the Pope says, is a, a human trait. Um, it's a confidence in humanity. Okay. But I do spend a lot of time thinking about it, Teresa. So... At some stage, I'm going to have to write a really good essay. Um, the, the best essay I've written it, on it at the moment is my Easter essay, where I say, you don't have to make the choice. You can have faith, hope, and optimism. I think I've said that one to you, Teresa. Yeah, no, I mean, I believe, I mean, I believe the same. I think many of us think of faith and, as being religious, as you say, but I actually don't necessarily agree with that. I think you can have faith in yourself. I think you can have faith in humanity. Faith can be so much bigger than religion. And I think so many people have put it in a box. This is for people who believe in this, have this religion, but I think it's much bigger, can be much bigger. It's very that. powerful. I would say faith is a fantastic underpinning for optimism. And in fact, the research uh, from Brookings Institute, Cynthia, um, really says faith is a huge underpinning. Um, for optimism, that, that, that people of faith tend to be more optimistic, even if the leaders of the Catholic and Anglican Church, um, you know, with their beliefs in original sin, etc., cetera, um, probably poo-poo it. Most, most religious would be optimistic. Can I ask a follow-up question then? Of course. So We're having a conversation. For me, optimism then would be a feeling, as opposed to faith being more of a, like a foundational belief. Would you agree with that or no? It's probably even more a trait. Okay. So, so for about 25% of the population, it's genetic um, parental conditioning. Um, for the rest, it's a matter of choice. So I'm like, I mean, I, you know, my parents were refugees. Um, my mother widowed when I was very young. So a refugee living in a strange land uh, and widowed with two little kids. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate in the sense that I've got that genetics and conditioning. Um, for most people, it, it's a choice. Okay. It's just a question to ponder because if optimism from, is a feeling, then that means just like any other feeling, it could potentially come and go. I can feel angry and then not feel angry. I could feel optimistic and then not feel optimistic. Yeah, I think optimistic is more persistent. One of the things I'm, I've been influencing the banks and others is to stop this sort of notion of a weekly, weekly optimism index. Uh, because optimism actually doesn't change. You know, it, it tends to be lifelong, um, increasing until you're in your late 60s, early 70s. And then you, you look at the statistical data, the, the epidemi epidemiological data, um, people start to get sick. You know, things start to fall off or, or you start to get dementia or the like. But in fact, as a trait, it increases in intensity over your lifetime. Okay, thank you. But, but they're, really that they're really interesting questions. And a lot of this stuff you know, wasn't there when we were at uni. You know, it was um, 
the research over the last 10 years because you can use MRIs and watch the living brain. So this, the, the Dalai Lama has been involved in a lot of the research on the impact of meditation and optimism. And he's an incredibly strong rap for optimism. He says, choose optimism, it feels better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. he's been doing a lot of work with brain science and I actually spent time with one of the brain science people working with him. You'll like this, Teresa. He, they've actually got a project trying to look at what happens to the brain of a dying monk and um, trying to work out um, you know, if there is any evidence for that movement to the afterlife. Um, mm -hmm. So I love, love his mixture of theology and science. Yes, it is. He talks a lot about optimism in his book, The Book of Joy, and the difference between joy and, uh, and faith and hope and joy and happiness and how they all intermingle together in various ways. So, so, so thank you, you so gonna, much for... You're going to have to join the Centre for Optimism. I think you, you, <laughs> have got, you have got such an instinctive interest in this. I am a very optimistic person, and I definitely hope to inspire others to lean towards optimism as well, for sure. Ah, you're in, you're in, you're in. And I think once, once we can all travel, we're going to have to do a physical retreat somewhere in your area. Well, T Teresa is actually our president, Victor, um, for the Professional Women's Network down here. So Thank quite a few you. of the people on the call are actually physically down here. Not all, all of those, there's a few people from other areas, but um, a lot of the people on the call today are in the area. So, so yes, when we can finally travel again, maybe we'll have an in-person cafe and introduce you to the, the rosés of uh, the south of France, which I'm sure you've already tested, but maybe we have a few secret places. I'm sure you can find secret places, but let's let's make you the nucleus of the optimists of the south of France. Yeah, and and we'll also invite Helen Mack to come over because she said she'd be happy to. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Another, another and, and, absolute consultant in optimism. Yeah, and Teresa, I'm doing an event next week with brilliant women in Melbourne, and I think the time zone of that meeting is really good. So maybe you guys would like to join in too. That would, um, uh, maybe I can link you up with brilliant women in Australia so that there's again, uh, gives you um, an even uh, greater set of partnerships. Yes, if you, if you send it to me, I'll make sure that we have all the information and I'll send it out to, we'll send it out to the people, the Professional Women's Network of, of our area. Um, yes. Also the Professional Women's Network does have different chapters. So there are, there is a Melbourne chapter, there's, or the Australian chapter, American chapter, there's many th chapters and people can actually go and watch the webinars for all of the different chapters. I'm not sure everybody realizes that you don't just have to watch things produced by your own chapter. You can watch things produced by global as well. Um, and any other chapter around the world and often they're recorded. So in this time, it's a, it's a good thing to, for people to, to do. So we're, we're, we've come up to the hour. So um, I'd like to, you know, thank you very much for Victor for um, spending the time with us okay, a little late over there in Australia and uh, for, for sharing all of your, your wonderful ideas and research about optimism. Um, does anyone have any final things to say before uh, we close the call? And also I should thank Vanessa who rescued me from being stuck in the, the, the virtual waiting room hell. Uh, so. I just want to say thank you very much. It's been really, really good. Really lovely to... Uh, I've been doing some work ready for a leadership lab around resilience and that, and it, and it helps just to sort of um, give a little bit more depth into, into that as well. So, yeah, it's very good. And there's a page on, on the relationship between optimism and resilience on the website. So if you just oh, really? in the okay. search bar just to search for resilience, there's yeah. quite a lot there because the, the science says optimism is the underpinning of resilience. So yes, I like that idea as well, and um, we're linking it to personality, and so it uh, it just gives another angle to it, which is really interesting. So, yeah. so my only comment, Amanda, is I, I've just loved being with you. The hour has flashed by. I, um, <laughs> I thought we'd been going half an hour. Um, so everyone, um, if I can offer you all just just as my gift, um, full membership of, of the centre. Um, and, and share the research that we do. And, and if you guys want to do a little research project in your community um, that picks up some of those attitudes, I'm happy to give you the questions and help you to give the infrastructure to support that as well. Be good. 
Okay, great, excellent. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, you know, we we really enjoyed having you, and we'll we'll enjoy even more when we can travel and you can you can come in person on one of your many trips around the world. <laughs> It's done. It's done. So, um, 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 Teresa, you're sending me the email addresses of those who want to join the center and, and I'll just load them up and then they can fill in the other details. Okay. Yeah. We have the email, we have the emails of everybody who's here, so we can send them, uh, Great. we can send them the information for sure. Yes. And we'll also be sending you all out um, a, a follow up to the, to the meeting. So um, as part, as part of our process for these virtual webinars, so you can expect that as well from, from us. Actually, Teresa, I just remember, I actually did PWN is the abbreviation, isn't it? Yes, Professional Women's yeah. Network. Yeah. Uh, so if you go onto the website, um, the subscription already has a discount code, PWN, which gives you a free subscription. Okay, so the code is PWN? Yep, capital. Oh, beautiful. So we can just email that directly to all the people who came today. Yeah. For the subscription level, if they want membership level, just get them to whiz me another message and I'll just lift them up. Okay, fabulous. Thanks for Thank that you. beautiful yeah, gift. Pleasure. Cynthia, well, you're on such... mute. I think you're trying to say something and you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to, to say that when the meeting started, I had trouble uh, getting in. The message kept saying the, the meeting has not begun yet for about 10 minutes. Then I closed it down. I started. So if you had expected more people, they might have gotten the same message. You might, it's the first time I've gotten that message with the Zoom meeting. So you just might want to check out the, the, the setup or whatever. Yes, we need to find out what happened because we all got stuck in the virtual waiting room, um, including me, who's the meeting host. Yeah. So um, Vanessa managed to rescue us from that, but we need to figure out what's happening. We're still learning how to do these. This is only our second one. So um, we're on a learning curve with it, but I, I do know some people who had planned to, to join us and didn't. And I think it took me about 10 minutes and it was only closing it down and reopening that I got in. Just, yes. just so, so you, you can play with that. Thank bit. you for that feedback. Yes, and I should also let everybody know we recorded the meeting so we can also send that out to people to let them know. Though, of course, it's more fun to be here in, in person. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Victor, for joining Goodbye. us. Bye. Bye. Bye.